All right, good morning. Um, later in the program, uh, I'm going to give some additional talks that are literally chapters from the book I've just finished about George Herbert Walker Bush. Uh, one will deal with a controversial uh, cabinet nomination that he made early in his presidency. The other will deal uh, with uh, a very controversial international intervention that he carries out at the very end of his presidency. This talk is different. Uh, I want to do a couple of different things uh, in the time I have with you, and I want to leave lots of time uh, for your uh, questions and discussion. First, I want to put the Bush 41 administration and the president in the context of modern presidency in general. So I'll say some things about his background and the background of the other presidents who served uh, in, uh, in recent uh, memory. That shouldn't take too long with an audience like this one. It takes a little longer with 18-year-olds uh, who uh, don't have uh, the background uh, you do uh, in American politics and, uh, and American uh, political events. Then I want to talk a bit more than I was able to last night about the 1988 presidential campaign. It's an interesting one in a number uh, of respects. And I actually want to say some critical things about that uh, campaign, because uh, in many ways, uh, it ignored the most important issues that were facing uh, the country at the time. Of course, that's not all that unusual uh, with presidential uh, <laughs> campaigns. But uh, in this case, I, I want to draw our attention to that. Uh, and then finally, I want to say a few words about uh, the mistake that is commonly made in commentary about the Bush presidency. There are many, uh, but I want to draw your attention to the one that I think is, uh, is the most important. The thing that's commonly said about President Bush is not just wrong, but it's a lot wrong. Uh, and uh, uh, just to... Uh, not leave that hanging. Uh, I want to uh, say that when we describe George Herbert Walker Bush as cautious and prudent, we're wrong. Uh, in his style, in his rhetoric, he often was a cautious uh, person. In his actions uh, in the White House, I think we see a very different story. And that's the thing I want to uh, draw your attention to and see what your reaction is. Uh, in the comments and questions. All right. Um, presidents arrive in the White House from different places. Uh, Herbert Walker Bush has a very common one. Uh, he goes from the vice presidency uh, to the White House. Uh, it's also common uh, to be a governor uh, and be elected uh, president. It's a little less common to be a senator, although, of course, some of these people were senators before they were vice presidents. Uh, and it's very unusual to have no prior elected office. And even Eisenhower, who had no prior elected office, had a full career of public service before uh, he ran uh, for uh, the presidency. Um, so Bush is in uh, this group. And I want to uh, just emphasize one difference he has from the others. Uh, the others had won uh, a number of statewide races to be a, a senator from Texas or from California uh, or, uh, of course, elected to the vice presidency as well. Uh, a longtime member of the House, uh, Truman, uh, elected to the Senate as well. Uh, Bush uh, tries for a Senate seat twice in Texas and misses both times. He does serve in the House of Representatives but for only two terms. That's unusual. He's less of a politician in some respects than the other vice presidents who ascend to the presidency. All right, some more background information. I think it's possible to describe some of the individuals who become president as lifelong politicians. Somewhere in their 20s, they start running for office, and they never stop. Uh, that's certainly true of uh, Kennedy Johnson, Nixon, uh, Ford, and Bill Clinton. 
Uh, some do something else uh, before their political uh, career uh, begins. And again, uh, Herbert Walker uh, is in uh, that category. Um, you can't say that W. and Truman had a lot of success as young men. <laughs> Uh, but later in their careers, uh, they did uh, before uh, arriving in the White House. <clears throat> and Obama is a difficult one to describe uh, as well. He goes to the White House from the Senate, but I think he served in the Senate for two years. Uh, and that's a very unusual path to arrive on the national scene and two years later uh, ascend uh, to the White House. Um, how did the presidencies end? It's common to win two terms. If you want to count Kennedy Johnson as one administration, uh, then there'd be one more on the list of uh, two-term uh, administrations. Um, it's uncommon to be defeated, or less common to be defeated, uh, as a sitting uh, president. Ford is, Carter is. Uh, and of course, uh, Bush uh, as well. Um, Truman and Johnson could have run uh, in 1952 and in 1968, uh, they chose uh, not to. If you add them to those who were defeated, uh, the two lists are, are closer uh, match. And of course, uh, Nixon resigned, uh, Kennedy uh, was assassinated. All right, uh, some more of this uh, background uh, comparison. Um, most of our presidents don't come from wealthy, privileged, upper class uh, families. Some do, uh, and two come from uh, the same family. Uh, that's not the typical background. Most of our presidents uh, grew up in small towns uh, and had uh, families of relatively uh, modest uh, means. Uh, I suppose Carter's family was wealthy for the area of Georgia he lived in. He wasn't wealthy for the rest of uh, America. Um, among those who are wealthy and privileged, uh, a few go to uh, Ivy League uh, colleges. Uh, two transferred into Ivy League colleges. Uh, Obama uh, and Trump. Um, others attended schools we all know about, military academies, University of Michigan, uh, Georgetown, uh, and some went to places, what? Uh, uh, it, it's reassuring to young people to know if you don't get into a great college, there's still a future. Uh, you can uh, ascend uh, to the highest levels. Uh, and of course, Truman uh, didn't have any uh, college a degree. Uh, this is uh, the famous Bush uh, resume. Uh, and it's often said he had one of the richest resumes at the time he was elected uh, to uh, the presidency. I want to point out a couple uh, things uh, about it. I've already mentioned that his electoral success is relatively modest. He wins in a Houston congressional district twice. Uh, it's a relatively safe district for uh, a Republican. In the Barry Goldwater year, uh, 1964, he runs for the Senate uh, in Texas. That's still a period of time in which the Democratic Party is the dominant party uh, in the state of Texas. He does better than Barry uh, Goldwater, uh, but he does not uh, win uh, that election. He comes back six years later gives up his safe seat in Congress, uh, and runs again. He was expecting to run against a very liberal member of the Senate uh, who decides not to seek another term. Uh, Lloyd Benson, uh, well, he decided because he lost the <laughs> primary, right? Uh, Lloyd uh, Benson, uh, a more conservative Democrat, uh, wins the nomination in 1970 and then uh, takes uh, the Senate seat. Following that, he does uh, the list of things uh, we know about. Uh, I interviewed one person who worked in the administration who said, you have to remember, George Herbert Walker Bush isn't like other presidents. 
he's more like a British prime minister. He's someone who was given difficult tasks that he performed well, and he was rewarded by being given another difficult task. And that's uh, the most important learning period uh, in his uh, public service, and it's unusual. We don't typically have a president who does the variety of things uh, that George Herbert Walker Bush did. Moreover, two of the things on that list should have killed his political career. He was the head of the Republican Party during Watergate. If, talk about thankless jobs. Uh, he performs it with real finesse. He is supportive of the president until the end, when he, of course, uh, is not, uh, and uh, holds the party together in this very controversial, uh, very difficult uh, time. The other job that should have killed his uh, political career was director of the CIA. It is presumed that that position ought to be held by someone who is nonpartisan, someone who isn't uh, running for office. When he takes the assignment uh, as uh, the director of the CIA, uh, Ford makes an announcement, uh, I won't think of him as a vice presidential nominee, though there had been talk about that as a possibility uh, prior to the 1976 uh, presidential campaign. Moreover, the presumption is once you do that job, uh, you really won't uh, be able to return to politics. Uh, George Herbert Walker Bush really likes the job as CIA director. It's again an enormous challenge because the CIA had been investigated by the Senate and the House of Representatives for a variety of uh, uh, controversial uh, things that had happened earlier in their, uh, in their history. Uh, they were at a low point in terms of institutional uh, morale and institutional respect across the country. In a very short time, uh, Bush manages uh, to turn that around. And he actually goes to President Carter and says, if you want, I'll stay in this job. Uh, had Carter said yes, that would have ended, I think, his uh, political career, uh, at least for uh, running for national office. Uh, Carter doesn't, uh, and uh, four years later, uh, he makes a run uh, for uh, the, the White House. An unsuccessful run, uh, but a run that has surprising uh, success early on. He wins in Iowa. Uh, he and Reagan are the two principal uh, opponents. Uh, loses the nomination and eventually becomes uh, the vice uh, presidential nominee. Again, I want to make the point uh, I've already made, but uh, just to repeat it. He's not a great campaigner. His son is going to win two statewide races in Texas. His dad won two statewide races in Connecticut. Uh, he does not uh, ride the rise of the Republican Party uh, in Texas and in the South that he was hoping to and that many people expected him to. He's not the strongest campaigner uh, in the world. He has early success in 80, uh, loses it uh, on the stage of a debate uh, in, uh, uh, in New Hampshire. Uh, his claim or his uh, argument that he should be elected uh, in 1988 has more to do with the range of experience than it does with uh, electoral uh, success. All right, the day he announces that he's running for his own term, 1988, uh, Newsweek uh, hammers him. The story in Newsweek is actually not that bad. It's a long profile about his heroics in uh, World War II, the various jobs he has uh, held, the many friends he has across the country. It's not a terrible story. The headline was bad. Uh, the headline was the suggestion that uh, he's not uh, a strong-willed uh, and powerful uh, person. That wimp factor was a quote from a number of people who I think were trying to damage his presidential uh, campaign and argued that the loyalty he had for Ronald Reagan 
was excessive. Uh, he was too quiet uh, in his White House uh, years, not sufficiently uh, independent, and maybe not a real member of uh, the Reagan uh, revolution. Uh, that label uh, did uh, real damage uh, to his run uh, in 1988. And it's, again, one of those labels that I want to argue uh, with you or for you uh, later on uh, is uh, wildly wrong. Um, his campaign in 1988 uh, involves uh, a particular political strategist, uh, Lee Atwater, who had been a partner of Roger Stone and Paul Manafort. He, that used to be something you would put on your resume. You might not do that uh, any, uh, any longer. Um, uh, Atwater uh, was a tough uh, campaigner uh, and uh, ran uh, a, a strategic campaign that uh, succeeded. Lee Atwater said uh, that we are going to win against Michael Dukakis because I am going to make more voters know the name of Willie Horton than know uh, the name of uh, Bush's vice president. Uh, we are going to tie that name uh, to his campaign. Uh, this is an ad that shows Willie Horton's face. Um, the Bush campaign never ran an ad that showed his face. Outside groups did. Outside groups that don't coordinate with uh, the central presidential campaign. If you believe that, I have a bridge to sell you some. Uh, <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, it was in some ways an unfair uh, attack uh, on Dukakis. Dukakis had been the governor of Massachusetts. When a prisoner, Willie Horton, uh, went on a furlough uh, and then went on a crime spree, uh, stabbing a young man, raping his fiance. A horrendous crime. Uh, it wasn't necessarily Dukakis's fault. He didn't review who gets furloughs in the state prison. He didn't sign the f legislation that created the furlough program. That was done by a previous uh, governor. Um, I think there was a furlough program in California that Ronald Reagan had signed off on. Uh, it was a common at that point uh, in uh, prison administration. Nevertheless, uh, that horrendous crime, and particularly the fact that it was a crime by a black criminal against uh, uh, white victims, uh, sent uh, a message that Atwater thought uh, would be very uh, important, very helpful uh, in the campaign. Um, I call it a, a vapid and vacuous campaign. Again, that's, it's not the only one. There, there are many that fit that description. Uh, here's why I think we missed opportunities in 1988. There were two big questions, one domestic, one foreign, that hardly got talked about in 1988. The domestic issue was, what are we going to do about the debt? Reagan's administration had begun with a uh, trillion dollar uh, national debt. That sounds so quaint, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, uh, how could anyone have worried about a trillion dollar uh, national debt. It ended with a four trillion dollar uh, national debt uh, and a kind of frozen Washington. Uh, there wasn't new money to do anything. Uh, there were uh, large Democratic majorities uh, in the House and Senate. Bush is going to enter the White House with the largest majorities of the opposition party in control of Congress. Uh, there were plenty of things that uh, uh, got vetoed plenty of problems associated with it. What are we going to do? What are we going to do about the deficit problem? Neither candidate talked about it. Bush famously said, I won't raise taxes. That was the line uh, from his acceptance speech that got the biggest applause and, uh, and the most attention uh, thereafter. Uh, Dukakis promised all kinds of new programs, but whenever he was asked, how are you going to pay for that? He didn't really have an answer. Sound familiar?
Uh, so uh, neither was talking realistically about what we would have to do if indeed uh, the deficit was a problem to be uh, taken seriously. On the international side, the Cold War was coming to an end. In 1988, Margaret Thatcher declared that it was over. Um, so did George Shultz, the outgoing uh, Secretary uh, of State. Even Ronald Reagan, who in his final year made a visit to Moscow, was asked, how does it feel to be visiting the evil empire? Uh, he stopped the reporter and said, no, 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 no. That was a different time. Uh, this is a different uh, place. Uh, the Cold War was coming to an end, and that led to lots of important questions. Well, what's that going to mean for the defense budget? What's that going to mean uh, for uh, uh, European security? Uh, what do these uh, developments that were then going on uh, in Poland, in Hungary, uh, elsewhere in Eastern Europe, how far will they go? What do they mean? There was hardly any talk about that in 1988 at all. There were three presidential debates, two uh, by the presidential candidates, one by the vice presidents. In all of that, there was one question, one question, what do you think about Gorbachev? What do you think the future of US-Soviet uh, relations were? Neither uh, Dukakis or Bush said anything interesting in response to that question. Now, during the campaign, uh, President Bush, or candidate Bush, gave a very important speech uh, in uh, Chicago about his foreign policy vision for US-Soviet uh, relations. It was a speech in which he was, for the first time in many ways, uh, critical of Ronald Reagan. In the speech, he said, Reagan got it wrong in his first term. He was way too hard on the Soviet Union. The evil empire pushed things too far. And he got it wrong in his second term, too. Uh, the cozying up uh, to Gorbachev, uh, the talk uh, when they met, uh, to talk about the possible elimination of nuclear weapons altogether was going way too far. Uh, the Reagan administration did well, the speech said, in its relations uh, with the Soviet Union, but the tone of their messaging was too harsh and too soft. I'm going to come in and balance that. That was a really interesting speech. Nobody talked about it because it was delivered in the same week that Michael Dukakis uh, rode around in a tank. Uh, and everybody just wanted to talk about that picture, the doofus hat, and uh, what it suggested uh, about his uh, weakness. Um, we missed a big opportunity in 1988. It would have been nice uh, if the American public had been let in on what the two candidates hoped to do, expected to do, what they thought about uh, the changes that were taking place in the world order, it didn't happen. Arguably, the most important question in uh, the uh, candidate debates was uh, the inappropriate one that was asked of Michael Dukakis. You're an opponent of the death penalty. What would you do if your wife, Kitty, uh, was raped and murdered, how would you feel about the treatment we should give to that uh, perpetrator? Uh, Dukakis gave an incredibly uh, low-key, uh, awkward, uh, and uh, unemotional answer. Now, that may have been revealing. He was a kind of low-key, unemotional uh, person. Uh, and the American public may have seen something about his character uh, from that uh, response. But that question uh, dwarfed all the various attempts reporters uh, might have made uh, to ask about the substance of uh, domestic uh, and international uh, politics. Um, this is the map uh, we looked at briefly uh, last night with a little more detail about the intensity of support that Bush won in uh, 1988. Uh, in terms of the Electoral College, this is a very decisive victory, uh, 400 and, 
uh, uh, 26 uh, to 111. But as I mentioned last night, it's the last time there's a decisive uh, Republican victory uh, in presidential politics. Uh, Bush was the last Republican uh, to win California. He was the last Republican to win Illinois. After his campaign, no one wins on the Republican side, Connecticut, Maryland, or Vermont. Uh, moreover, and more pertinent to our recent experience, uh, he was the last Republican to win Michigan and Pennsylvania until, of course, uh, Trump does uh, in 2016. I, I want to again save this topic for our question and answer, for discussion with you. Uh, I'm uh, very interested in uh, why you think this happened. What happened to uh, the Republican Party's strength between 1988 and 1992. All right, presidential approval ratings. This doesn't have everyone, I'm sorry, I don't have the Obama and, uh, uh, and Trump numbers. We can uh, say a bit about them uh, on a slide that's coming up. Uh, a couple things about presidential approval. First, it's very rare, Eisenhower and Kennedy never dip below 50%. Kennedy's was, of course, a partial term. Uh, but they remain popular presidents throughout their time uh, in the White House. Everyone else crosses that line, except, of course, Donald Trump, who has never gotten above uh, 50%. Uh, the patterns appear to be different from administration to administration. Let me tell you what I think is the most important pattern uh, we're looking at. For a president who has peace and prosperity, Eisenhower, Reagan, uh, and Clinton, the movement has a relatively narrow range. Never wildly popular, never wildly unpopular. Uh, the movement tends to be patterned uh, after uh, national economic numbers. Not always, but tends to be patterned after national uh, economic uh, numbers. There's a recession late in uh, Eisenhower's uh, presidency. When things get better for Clinton uh, in the 1990s, uh, his approval rating uh, goes up. We think of uh, uh, Reagan as very popular, which he was when he left uh, office. But 1981 was a deep recession, uh, and there was a lot of skepticism about uh, the Reagan administration uh, in his first uh, year. So there are the peace and prosperity presidents who tend uh, to have this narrow range in which uh, they bounce around. Then there are the presidents uh, who uh, have uh, controversial uh, wars overseas. Uh, this line for Truman is the Korean War. Uh, this is, of course, Johnson in Vietnam. Uh, for Nixon, this is almost certainly the Watergate uh, experience. Uh, and and for W, uh, the controversy and growing controversy of the war uh, in Iraq. The really odd one on the list is ours, Herbert Walker Bush. Uh, that peak is a uh, victory in the first Gulf War. But then there's this huge fall off. You can understand a fall off in Korea. You can understand a fall off in Vietnam. You can understand a fall off in Iraq. Why is there a fall off after victory? Uh, well, uh, uh, it's again an economic downturn. It's not that severe an economic downturn. There is a recession that uh, occurs uh, in, uh, at the end of uh, uh, Bush's uh, presidency, but it's not as severe as the one that uh, uh, Reagan endured. Uh, it's not as uh, severe, certainly, as the one we get at the end of the Bush uh, administration, but it did lead to that dramatic drop. Uh, again, I'm curious about what you think. Why did that occur? Uh, and what was uh, that pattern uh, about? Uh, here's a different way of uh, measuring the mood of the country. Presidential approval rating is one. 
This is the standard question that is sometimes asked, is the country moving in the right direction? This is from Gallup. They ask it this way. Are you satisfied with the way things are going in the United States? And I want to draw our attention to that right side, Obama uh, and Trump, but first say a bit about what the regular pattern looks like. It again goes up and down. Right? Is the country heading in the right direction? Uh, we often get, uh, oh, yes, we are. That's 1991, beginning of 1991, victory uh, against Saddam uh, Hussein. Uh, that 70% for uh, George W. Bush uh, is 9-11 and the response to it and the rally around the flag uh, that occurred. So how people feel about the direction of the country tracks presidential approval. It is often a reflection of things that presidents have done. It's often a reflection of things that the presidents didn't have any control over uh, and uh, have uh, driven, uh, again, public sentiment uh, in a positive or negative uh, direction. Beginning with uh, Obama, there's never a recovery, right? Uh, how people feel about the country goes to a very low place in the Great Recession, as it would be expected to. The most serious economic crisis since the Great Depression drives many Americans to worry about our future. There is a recovery. It's slow, but it does occur. And for neither Obama nor Trump, do we go back uh, to high points? Do we go back to feeling good uh, about uh, the future? That may be related to uh, the rise in partisanship in American politics. Uh, it may be related because we no longer ever think that we're headed uh, in the right direction if the person in the White House doesn't belong to our tribe, our party, uh, our uh, point of view. Uh, this is the last one to deal with this subject. It repeats. This time you're looking at presidential approval divided by party. And uh, the party of the president is the line at top, the party of the opposition at the bottom. And a couple things I want to uh, draw our attention to. One is that for most of our recent history, Democrats and Republicans moved together, right? When uh, Eisenhower has that recession, Democrats don't like it, Republicans don't like it either. Right? Uh, when we come back and when uh, Eisenhower is popular uh, at the end of his term, he's clearly more popular with Republicans than with Democrats, but they both uh, move up. Moreover, the range between those two is not enormous. It's certainly not as big as it becomes with Clinton, with W, with Obama, uh, and with uh, Trump. So uh, range matters. The pattern of moving together is somewhat, I think, reassuring. When Nixon has his Watergate problem, it's not just Democrats uh, who uh, lose faith uh, in him. Uh, it's Republicans uh, as well. OK, for George Herbert Walker Bush, he actually looks more like these earlier presidents. The distance between his Republican and Democratic supporters isn't that great. Uh, Reagan, Clinton, uh, his son, Obama, much more divisive uh, than is uh, George uh, Herbert Walker Bush. And then there's, a, again, this important thing to note near the end. Uh, Obama doesn't have Republicans and Democrats moving in any common pattern. He's losing Republican support all along. All right. Um, this is the word almost everyone associates with George Herbert Walker Bush. Uh, they get it largely not from Bush, uh, but for, uh, from Dana. Harvey. Uh, Bush had a good sense of humor. He didn't mind people making fun of him. 
the end of his administration, he invites Dana Carvey to come sleep at the White House uh, and attend uh, the Christmas party uh, in the White House. Barbara Bush is not fond of this invitation. <laughs> Uh, but Bush thought it would be funny. Uh, Carvey comes and says, uh, uh, I had fun last night uh, sleeping in the White House. I picked up the phone, called the Secret Service, and in the president's voice uh, said, you know, I want to take a jog tonight. I think I'm going to run in the nude. Uh, and he said, I, I looked out the window, and I could see all the Secret Service people running in circles around the uh, White House lawn. He also explained how you do President Bush. He said, if you want to imitate him, you start off with Mr. Rogers. You talk slowly. You talk calmly. You don't use big words, right? You start off as Mr. Rogers, but that doesn't get you to a good imitation. You have to throw in John Wayne. Uh, and I've always liked that description because, indeed, uh, Bush has his John Wayne moments, and that's what people uh, tend, uh, uh, tend uh, to miss. All right. Um, I want to uh, uh, talk about some of those bolder John Wayne moments in the Bush uh, presidency, because again, I don't think they get as much public attention as they should. Um, R Richard Nixon, uh, in the piece that's in your binder, uh, I repeat this quote, he was having a conversation with Larry King, uh, and, and he says, everybody underestimates George Bush. That's a big mistake. Uh, you tend to write him off, you don't take him seriously, and then he does the big play. Uh, there are lots of big plays uh, in uh, Bush's life uh, and career. When he graduates uh, from high school, he does not have to go into the military. The draft doesn't yet exist. His parents don't want him to go into the military. Go to college. Uh, get some additional education. You can serve uh, later in the Second World War. He defies his parents. No, I'm going now. Uh, that's, a, uh, that's an interesting uh, decision. When he comes back from the war, uh, graduates uh, from Yale, uh, the family has lined things up for him. Do you want to go to Wall Street? We have connections. Uh, you can arrive as a clerk and a few uh, years later be a vice president. Uh, there's a career for you uh, in uh, your uh, father's uh, circle of friends. He says, no, I don't want to do that. Uh, I want to go off and uh, do things on my own. And even though he has family help along the way, he's not alone. Uh, nevertheless, the decision to move to Texas is a kind of uh, surprising one. He makes bold decisions kind of throughout his life. One of the books uh, we read talks about his Texas uh, oil business. Uh, he and a neighbor, uh, when they form Zapata Oil, uh, each commit to raising half a million dollars, real money at that time, to put in to this uh, uh, oil business, and then they bet it all on one field. That's not typical. You would get a lease for one field, but then you'd sell fractions of it to other people to cover your bets. Uh, or uh, you would take your money and buy fractions of other people's leases uh, so that you'd be drilling in lots of different places and cover your bets that way. Uh, Bush doesn't do that. Uh, he and his partner uh, invest it all in one shot. Now they drill 127 wells and they all hit. That was not a bad decision, right? Uh, but it was a bold decision. And, I, and our author tells us there were lots of people in Texas who were utterly surprised that George Bush did that? Sure, people do that in the oil business. Uh, risk everything on one shot, but George Bush risked everything on one shot? Uh, he did. Uh, he was uh, uh, bolder than we gave him credit for. And I want to draw your attention in my remaining moments to uh, October 1990 and two important decisions uh, that Bush uh, made. October 1990 should have been a great month for the president. 
Uh, that was the month that German reunification was finalized. And not just finalized, but finalized on the terms that the president wanted, a united Germany uh, that would be a continuing member of the European Union, a continuing member uh, of uh, the NATO alliance. It is one of the biggest diplomatic successes of his four-year term and is little remembered partly because uh, it went so smoothly uh, and uh, succeeded beyond the expectations of most expert advisors. October 1990 was not a good month. Uh, Bush says it was the worst uh, in his uh, presidency. And there were two uh, crisis situations. One involved uh, writing the budget for 1991. When Bush first arrives in the White House, he keeps his pledge, no new taxes. That's very hard to do. He keeps his pledge, no new taxes, uh, works out a compromise with the Democrats in which they play games uh, with uh, uh, projected tax revenues, play games with various other things, sell off some federal assets to raise uh, at least a little bit of revenue to cover uh, the deficit and promise the American people that they are complying with a law that was passed at the end of the Reagan administration, the Graham-Rudman Act, sometimes called the Graham-Rudman-Hollins Act, that mandated uh, congressional uh, action to address the deficit and said, if Congress fails to address the deficit, there will be across the board uh, budget cuts. There will be sequestration, which we came to call it later on. Um, they finesse it in 1989, uh, just barely, get through uh, the year uh, without having to uh, uh, significantly or in a meaningful way raise uh, taxes. Uh, but 1990 is not uh, a kind year. Uh, the budget is in much more uh, serious uh, uh, arrears, and there's going to have to be a compromise. In the summer of 1990, uh, Bush got in enormous trouble by, uh, in some ways, uh, reneging on his no new taxes pledge. In the summer of 1990, in July, he said, we're negotiating between the White House and the Democrats on Capitol Hill, and everything is on the table. Well, that set off the alarm bells. Everything on the table, it means he's going to uh, raise taxes. Uh, he took enormous criticism uh, at the time, but October is the crunch. October 1st is when you need to pass a new budget for the next uh, fiscal year. And the president indeed works out a budget compromise uh, with the Democrats that includes new taxes. It does not include changes in the income tax rates. It doesn't include any uh, 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 alteration. Uh, of the percentage you pay at the different uh, steps uh, in income tax, but it does involve uh, new taxes. It does involve cuts in spending that lots of the Democrats uh, are unhappy uh, about. And at Bush's insistence, the negotiations between the White House and the Democrats also try to get at this long-term problem. We can't have a budget crisis every year. How are we going to manage this uh, in the future? Bush insists there have to be changes on Capitol Hill. And the changes are, uh, that are proposed are substantial. Uh, this is when we get uh, pay-as-you-go. This is when we get rules uh, changed in the House and Senate that say you can't create a new program unless you tell the American people where the money to pay for it is going to come from. If you create a new program, you have to raise revenue. If you create a new program, you have to cut spending somewhere else. Pay as you go gets uh, incorporated. Moreover, there are technical changes to the rules uh, by which uh, budgets are made uh, and approved in the House and Senate that have the effect of restraining individual members from uh, succeeding in getting to the floor with new and expensive uh, proposals. The agreement uh, at the beginning of October uh, of 1990. Uh, does mean the president is compromising on his central uh, promise in 88, and Newt Gingrich rebels. He's then a rising star uh, in uh, the House of Representatives, 
part of the leadership team that was negotiating with the White House, uh, had said he was on board with the compromises that were being made, but at the last minute uh, pulls out. He then makes an unholy alliance, there are lots of those in Washington, right? Uh, with uh, the liberal Democrats who don't like the spending cuts that are part of the package. Together, they defeat the budget. That leads to a month of uh, public uh, negotiations uh, that uh, are uh, swirling uh, in uh, controversy. For Bush's critics, Ginrich has given you an opportunity. You can go back and keep your promise. Uh, you can join him uh, and say there'll be no new taxes. Uh, Bush uh, is advised to do that by at least some members of his uh, 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 White House staff and outside advisors. Uh, he doesn't. He goes back to negotiations with the Democrats, but now he's going back in a weak position. He can't deliver votes uh, in the House of Representatives. Uh, they have a stronger uh, case uh, to be made, and they force uh, an increase in the uh, tax rate uh, for the upper bracket. Um, this is the issue that dominates newspapers in October of 1990. Uh, I think uh, the front page story uh, in the New York Times, uh, the one above the fold, the important story, uh, is on the budget uh, 17 or 18 days uh, in the month of uh, October. Uh, and the president is fully aware of, uh, well, I should take that back. He's certainly aware that it's going to be a costly decision for him to uh, sign on legislation that ends the no new taxes uh, pledge. I'm not sure he knows how damaging it will be, uh, but he knows it's going to hurt him. Uh, his approval rating is declining at this uh, point. Uh, and he sees uh, the writing on the wall about uh, how uh, difficult this would be. He decides uh, to do it anyway. And he uh, uh, believes that that decision uh, was important uh, because uh, of those long-term uh, commitments that he gets from Capitol Hill that have at least the possibility uh, of uh, fixing uh, the problem. And indeed, there are two fixes to the Reagan deficits. One takes place in October 1990 in this compromise. The other takes place in the first year of Clinton's uh, administration uh, when he doesn't do a typical Democratic budget uh, and uh, both raises taxes and keeps a lid on uh, spending. Uh, those two steps uh, are the things uh, that get us to a point where we can actually have a balanced budget later uh, in the 1990s. Uh, Clinton gets credit for that. Clinton claims credit for that on a regular uh, basis. Uh, so do uh, the Republicans on Capitol Hill who compromised with him to get to those balanced budgets. This important step in that process is forgotten. Persian Gulf, they are related. In August, uh, Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait. Within uh, a day or two, uh, the president has made his public announcement, this will not stand. Uh, within a couple of days, there's a commitment to put American troops in Saudi Arabia to defend it against any further aggression on the part of Saddam Hussein. It's now October. The president has put together this remarkable coalition of countries in Europe, Asia and in the Middle East, all united in opposition uh, to Saddam Hussein, all cooperating uh, in sanctions uh, against Iraq. Uh, it's frequently said putting together that coalition uh, was uh, an important accomplishment uh, for Bush. Bush is convinced it wasn't putting it together, it was holding it together. It was constantly under strain. In October, uh, the Soviet Union is sending representatives around the Middle East trying to sell uh, some negotiated uh, resolution that will allow Saddam Hussein to save face and not pay a penalty for having invaded uh, his neighbor. The president is opposed to that. Uh, Jordan, 
King of Jordan is proposing uh, a compromise that, again, the president has to uh, fight against. In Israel, uh, the largest uh, demonstration uh, that, that results in violence at the Temple Mount takes place. Uh, and Israeli security forces uh, kill, I think, 22 uh, demonstrators uh, in Jerusalem. The largest loss of life on a single day in Jerusalem uh, in, uh, uh, in the Israeli experience. Uh, and the United Nations then prepares to condemn Israel. Uh, Bush is caught by that. Uh, he uh, works hard to uh, moderate uh, the UN condemnation of Israel, but in the end, the United States has to vote for it. Has to vote for it because, again, how are you going to keep uh, the anti-Saddam Hussein coalition together if Saddam Hussein succeeds in presenting himself as the real uh, champion of uh, uh, Palestinians and you don't uh, join uh, that cause with the rest of the international uh, community. Moreover, October 1990 is the time when one of the most important decisions in the Gulf War has to be made. The deployment of American troops to Saudi Arabia to defend Saudi Arabia is finishing. We have over 200,000 troops. We have lots of airplanes. We have three aircraft carrier task forces. They're all in place. Uh, we are fully able, says Central Command, to defend Saudi Arabia uh, against Saddam Hussein. Well, what if we have to use force against Saddam Hussein? Are we ready? The president asked that question, and early in October, uh, there's a briefing uh, that uh, he and his uh, senior uh, national security advisors receive, and they're appalled. The uh, uh, Pentagon says, well, if we have to take action against Saddam Hussein, and we might have had to take action at any moment, he might have begun to do harm to uh, the U.S. citizens who were being more or less held hostage in Iraq. Uh, he might have done something else uh, provocative. We might have had to use military force. When he asked the Pentagon what would it look like, they say, well, we would stand up in uh, Saudi Arabia, march across the border, uh, and go directly uh, after uh, Saddam Hussein's defensive positions, a direct assault. Uh, how many casualties would that produce? A very large number. So. Uh, the uh, uh, president is disappointed with that, so is the Pentagon, so is uh, Dick Cheney, uh, so is uh, Brent Scowcroft, uh, go back to the drawing board. They come back at the end of the month with a very different plan. Let's uh, double our deployment to Saudi Arabia, uh, and uh, we'll send armored divisions across southern Iraq in a sweeping movement, encircle uh, the Iraqi forces uh, in Kuwait and beat them without a direct uh, confrontation. Um, that becomes the plan that the president adopts at the end of the month. But I want to briefly describe to you and then bring this uh, to a conclusion, briefly describe to you that uh, National Security Council meeting. Uh, and it's a vivid description that you get from uh, Robert Gates, uh, who was there uh, and later gave an oral history. Uh, Gates was convinced that the Pentagon plan presented at the end of October was not serious. He thought they had in mind, we'll tell the president what it would take to win the war easily, and the price will be so high, the president will back down and say, well, we'll just defend Saudi Arabia and wait for the sanctions uh, to work their will. And indeed, uh, the briefing uh, takes place, uh, and uh, the Pentagon says, we're going to need six aircraft carriers uh, off the coast of Iraq. We had never put six aircraft carriers off the coast of anybody. Uh, that was a, a huge uh, number. Uh, we're going to take uh, the best armored divisions in Central Europe, the ones in Germany that have been defending uh, NATO uh, for decades. We're going to move them uh, to uh, Saudi Arabia. We're going to double the number of troops from 200,000 to close to half a million. Moreover, in order to do that, we're going to call up the reserves because we don't have enough uh, troops uh, uh, otherwise. 
Uh, and here's the kicker. After we do this, we're going to have to use that force or bring them home. There's no rotation. If we put half a million troops uh, in the Persian Gulf, uh, we have to use them or bring them home. It's more or less a decision to go to war. Uh, Gates uh, doesn't believe the president is going to buy this at all. Uh, and he says, to my dying day, I will remember vividly what George Bush did. At the end of the briefing, he stood up, grabbed his chair, and said, you've got it. Let me know if you need anything else. Leaves the room. And then uh, uh, Cheney says to Scowcroft, does he know what he just did? And Scowcroft, Cheshire smile, oh, yes, <laughs> he does. Um, that's an important element in understanding Bush. Uh, when the big play is necessary, he does it. Uh, that's the thing we most often uh, misunderstand uh, about him. Um, the Kennedy Foundation gave him the Profile of Courage Award for the budget decision. Uh, we know what happened uh, in Desert Storm. So uh, was George Bush a wimp? I don't think so. Uh, neither does Manuel <laughs> Noriega. Neither does uh, Saddam Hussein. Was he prudent? Uh, again, in style, in rhetoric, perhaps. Uh, but German reunification was an incredibly bold move that he takes a leading role in, and he does the same in the first Gulf War. Thank you. Now, remind me, 10 minutes, I, what do you think? What would you like to talk about? Yes. When you talk about the Gulf War, I remember my dissatisfaction was I thought it should have been a 200 hour war and they should have destroyed the Republican Guard. All right. And I, and I thought that was part of what some other Americans must have thought because I think that's the reason it had such a high rating and then it slowly came down. Now, I, don't, I don't know about other people, what, they, what their thoughts were. But I thought the Republican Guard should definitely have been destroyed before we quit. Okay. We didn't have to go to the Capitol or anything like that, but we needed to destroy the Republican Guard. Well, you're absolutely right that the decision to end the war uh, has been uh, much more controversial in the aftermath than the decision to enter it. Right? Uh, and um, there's a, a long history on that uh, question and the various uh, views people uh, held. Um, uh, we could have done more destruction of uh, both equipment and personnel in uh, the Iraqi army. There was at that point no resistance. It would have been destruction uh, at our uh, leisure, right? Uh, it would have been a shooting gallery as it was described. Uh, and uh, Powell had some reservations about that. The team as a whole were uh, more or less in agreement. We ought not to march to Baghdad, capture Saddam Hussein, and replace the government. Uh, some people thought they should have. Uh, they believed uh, that would be uh, a mistake. Now, partly they believed it would be a mistake because they were optimistic. Saddam Hussein won't be able to survive this humiliating defeat. Uh, he's going to be overthrown by uh, people around him or by uh, the population of uh, Iraq. The Iraqis will take care of Saddam Hussein in the future. That, of course, doesn't happen. Uh, and Saddam Hussein brutally puts down rebellions of the Shia in the south uh, and of the uh, Kurds uh, in the north. Uh, the president's view all along was we didn't enter this for a regime change. That was not our stated mission. We built the coalition around this invasion of Kuwait will not stand. Once we have achieved getting him out of uh, Kuwait and doing enormous damage to his political status, his military uh, position. Um, what well, wasn't the, the, the Schwarzkopf line? Uh, Saddam Hussein went from having the fourth largest army in the world to having the second largest army in Iraq, right? Uh, uh, it's, it's a pretty big uh, humiliation. Um, uh, that would be enough. 
And there were at least some people in the uh, president's circle, Scowcroft uh, most importantly, who understood that uh, if we were to move to Baghdad, if we were to replace Saddam Hussein, we would inherit a world of problems, something we learned later on. Right? Uh, and uh, problems we don't need and problems we don't want. Uh, but you're absolutely right. Uh, there's lots of criticism of that decision to end the war uh, too soon. Yes, sir. Well, my recollection of that was that the military, but particularly the pilots who were strafing and bombing the Iraqi army retreating on the road of death, it was a shooting gallery, it was just murder, and the pilots would come back in their after action reports and they were expressing really huge reservations about continuing this because this wasn't this wasn't war. This was just genocide, basically, and it went right to the top of the Pentagon. And you, you alluded to the fact that Powell expressed reservations. At that point, basically, the rank and file military just said, "We can't do this. This is this this will this will be on our heads for many, many, many generations because it was murder." Yeah, and, uh, and that argument did arrive at the president's desk. It was enormously persuasive to him. Yes, sir. I, saw, I seem to remember a speech, I think, in the 92 campaign when Bush was running against Clinton, and they asked him about the pledge, you know, read my lips, I'm in tank. I think he said, yeah, I raised them once and hated every second of it, and the Democrats agreeing and Google voted 32 times to raise them that I had to, uh, had to veto it. Is that correct? Do you remember him saying that line? Um, in the 92 uh, campaign, um, he does more or less, uh, is it apology the right word? Um, he tries to explain his decision uh, to raise taxes. And he does say, I hated doing it. He does say, I was forced into it by the overwhelming majorities that the Democrats held uh, in uh, the House and uh, Senate. So, uh, I, had I had a question. I, yeah. Have you seen the movie Vice? I have not. About, about Dick Cheney? I just wanted right. to know your opinion how, how accurate it was or if it was Hollywood. Uh, anybody seen that movie? Vice? The people I have talked to who know the movie well and the characters well uh, say it's good entertainment, it's not an accurate depiction in any way. Yes. I just had a comment about the German reunification. Yes. This I remember distinctly. I had been in, I lived in Chicago at the time, had been in a little restaurant for breakfast when this was being discussed. Most of the men that were in the restaurant were World War II vets who were vehemently opposed to German reunification. Yes. Um, so I think about that in context of their comments. I look at the European Union now. Um, Germany is hardly one of equals in that in the European Union. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, good decision, bad decision, who knows? Yeah, um, I, I regard it as a good decision. And the key to the decision is Bush disagreeing with those other veterans. He's one too, right? Uh, and uh, in his first year in office, he goes to Japan when the emperor dies, the emperor who ordered uh, the attack on the United States. Uh, he wants uh, people to recognize World War II is over uh, and uh, Japan has changed. Japan is our ally. He firmly believed that West Germany had changed. He firmly believed we want them to be part uh, of an alliance with the United States that has kept stability uh, in Europe since 1945. We want the United States to remain in Europe. We want a NATO that we continue to participate in because that's the best way to protect against any imagined uh, rise of uh, uh, German aggression in the future. But the key insight that Bush has and in this respect, he disagrees with lots of foreign policy experts and many people in the World War II generation. The key insight he has is 
democracy has worked in Germany. The Germans have changed. We can safely reunite uh, Germany and not expect uh, great uh, dangers to come. Moreover, if we don't reunite Germany and NATO, if we don't reunite Germany as an ally to the United States, if we set them on their own course, if they become independent in the center of Europe, far worse things will happen. If they don't have an American nuclear protection, they may think they need their own nuclear weapons. If, uh, if they are not part of our alliance in which we can influence uh, their behavior, uh, things could go badly uh, awry. Uh, so he has a, uh, some suspicions of what the future of Germany might be and uh, believes in his heart we're better off with Germany in the tent uh, than uh, Germany uh, uh, pushed out. Uh, but, uh, but again, his success in getting that done, uh, because it wasn't just hard with American veterans. It was hard with Margaret Thatcher. It was hard with Mitterrand. It was hard with everybody of consequence in Europe, and really hard with Gorbachev. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the fact that he gets that done is a really remarkable uh, accomplishment. And he does it so smoothly, so behind the scenes, so calmly, uh, he gets very little credit for what is a uh, remarkable diplomatic achievement. Are we ready to?